All right, great singing, guys. So if you've got your Bibles, I hope you're still open there in 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're continuing our series, the Rightly Dividing series, but uh, I've chosen to preach a slightly different sermon than what I normally preach. Um, this is going to feel a little bit more like a, a, a teaching lesson than, a, than preaching a sermon. But I think it's really important as we go through um, this uh, series on, on Rightly Dividing God's Word, I do believe that it's important that we go through the books of the Bible, the Old Testament books, the New Testament books. We start understanding the, the bigger picture of God's Bible, God's book, okay? And um, if you look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, a very common passage to many of you, 2, Tim 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, in righteousness. You see, one of the problems that a lot of Christians have, and I mentioned this in my last sermon, is that you know, a lot of Christians don't read their Bibles cover to cover. You know, maybe they read a lot of the New Testament. Generally, the New Testament's a lot easier to understand. We're living in New Testament times. I understand that. A lot of people have their favorite books. They have got their favorite books that they read over and over again. And very few Christians have actually read the Bible cover to cover. And yet the Bible tells us here in verse 16, all scripture, all of it, is given by inspiration of God. All of it's been given by God to you so you can grow in the Lord, so you can gain knowledge, so you can mature in the Lord. And so it's very important that, so that we don't become Christians that skip over books as we're going through our Bible reading. Right. You know, yes, there are those easier ones to read. Great. Praise God. Maybe you'll read them a little bit more often. But don't forget to read the entire book. Read it from cover to cover. All Scripture has been given to you by God. And so it's important that we understand what every book of the Bible is about, what it contains. And I think sometimes maybe the reason we avoid some of these books is we really don't know what it's about. And so it kind of goes over our heads a little bit. We're reading through it. We don't understand the historical setting. We don't understand the situation. We don't know the kings that are in play. Maybe we're not familiar with the prophets that are pre uh, preaching. And so we tend to skip certain books. Some are, some are harder to understand. But you've got to understand, as, if you're a believer, if you're saved, as you're reading the Bible, you have the Holy Ghost in you. It's not just you. It's not, you know, God hasn't left you alone to figure it all out by yourself. You know, He's given you church. He's given you a pastor. He's given this church other preachers, other men that can expound the Word of God. But He's given you the Holy Ghost. So when you're at home, you know, opening your Bibles in the mornings, in the evenings, the Holy Ghost can teach you the things that are found in God's book. And let me tell you, it's so much more exciting. You know, it's exciting to learn a truth from a preacher. You know, it is exciting. But it's so much more exciting when you learn stuff all by yourself. And you see the connections in the Bible. And you know, man, God showed me this. God revealed this truth to me. I understood this because I'm not a natural man. You know, I'm saved. I have the Holy Ghost. I have the new man in me. And it gets really exciting when you start to pierce the Bible together. And so we're not going to have a lot of Bible verses tonight. What I want to do is go through the books of the Old Testament. The title for the sermon tonight is Books of the Old Testament. And we're not going to get through all the Old Testament books. So we're going to be looking at the Pentateuch and the historical books. The Pentateuch, the Pentateuch and the historical books. And hopefully next week I can finish off the rest of the Old Testament books. But what I want you to do is still take your Bibles and go to the contents, the table of contents. The table of contents where you have the books of the Bible in order, the way they are placed. Don't look at the alphabetical list if you have the alphabetical list. Look at how it's placed there in the Bible. And as I go through these books, you'll have a better understanding what these books are about. Now, the Old Testament can be broken up into four major groups. And some people break it up to five groups. But four major groups. The first one is the Pentateuch. And that's what we're going to be covering today. The next group are the historical books. The group after that are the books of poetry or wisdom. Sometimes they're called poetry and wisdom. Um, and the final uh, lot of books that you have there in the Old Testament are known as the books of the prophets. And that group is usually broke, broken down into two groups the major prophets, and the minor prophets, okay? And there's a reason for this separation. We're talk, you know, this series is called Rightly Dividing, okay? So we looked at how God rightly divides for us the Old Testament and the New Testament, and this is a division God's given to us, right? This is obvious. We can look at it. We can see the division that God gives us, but then God's also given us these 66 books in the Bible, so we can divide between these books, all right? Now, you look at your Bible, you say, man, that's a huge book to get through. But the good thing is there's a lot of little books in there. And there are some larger books. There's 66 books in this. 
You read this cover to cover, you've read 66 books. Praise God. You might not be much of a reader, but you get through your Bible once a year. You can tell people, yeah, I've read 66 books this year. How good is that? All right. And it's all coming from the inspiration of God. It's all coming from God's Word. So we're not going to have time to look at the poetry books tonight, nor the uh, prophetic books. But again, like I said, we'll look at that next week. Uh, so the first thing I wanted to talk about is um, in the, when we talk about the Pentateuch. What's the Pentateuch? When you think of the word pent, uh, the pentagon, how many sides does a pentagon have? Five. Five sides. And when you talk about the Pentateuch, how many books do you think we're talking about here? One of the kids. How many books? Five books. Absolutely. Now, I, I don't know if this is a little bit, uh, uh, m- maybe a little bit too easy for the adults tonight. I don't know. But I hope the kids can learn something from this and can really appreciate uh, the Bible that they do have. And so these first five books of the Bible, if you can look at it there, look at, look at your Bible there. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. All these five books are known as the books of Moses. The author of these five books was Moses himself. And this isn't just traditional. Jesus Christ confirms this for us several times that Moses is the writer of these books. I'll give you one example. If you want to keep your finger there, go to Mark 12. Go to Mark 12, verse 26. Mark chapter 12, verse 26. Mark chapter 12, verse 26. Quite often when you look this up, they say, well, traditionally, people believe that Moses wrote these books. We don't have to think about tradition, all right? When we have Jesus Christ himself tell us that these books are written by Moses. Mark 12, verse 26. And as touching the dead, that they rise, have ye not read in the book of Moses, how in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? Where are those words found? Where do you think? Anyone? God speaking out of the bush, saying these words. Which book of the Bible is that recorded in? Exodus. All right, so immediately you know, according to Jesus, this is a book of Moses. Exodus was written there by Moses. All right, and, and you'll find many times Jesus Christ refers to Moses as the author of these books, and, he, and he, he refers to many times Old Testament passages and points back to that being written by Moses. So we're looking at the Pentateuch, the first five books here. And let's start off with Genesis. If you go back to your table of contents there, we're starting off with Genesis, and it's, uh, it's, it's adequately named Genesis. If you guys don't know what Genesis means, Genesis, Genesis means beginning or origin. The beginning or origin. And of course, Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It goes perfectly with the Bible. I just love how God is. I love how he calls that first book, Genesis, it's the beginning. I was talking to one of my sons, I think it was Matthias, this, uh, this week. And Matthias was like, what did God do for millions of years before he created all things? Well, there was no millions of years. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And if that goes over your head, praise God. That's how big the God is that we worship. You know, that we can't fully wrap our minds around His eternal nature. I I can't fully wrap my mind around that, but I know He's eternal. He eternally was and He eternally will be. And there's nothing outside of our Lord God. He did not come from anywhere. He always was. And so the book of Genesis is adequately named that. And it covers a period of approximately 2,300 years. Now, I don't know if you realize that, but as we're going through the book of Genesis, we're rushing through the decades, we're rushing through the centuries. It might not seem that way because initially a lot of these people lived very long lives. So they're going through a, you know, a long lifespan. But it covers that, that long period, 2,300 years. The book of Genesis is longer than all the other Bible books combined. If you put all the other Bible books together as a timeline, the book of Genesis as a period of time is still longer than all the other books joined together. All major Christian doctrines are also found in the book of Genesis. I don't know if you've noticed that. As we're going through the book of Genesis, we're learning about, you know, God's creation of earth. We learn about the curse that's fallen upon the earth, how how man has sinned, and how God provided, you know, a sacrifice, a blood atonement, how God destroyed the earth because of wickedness. We learn about the sacrifices. We learn about, um, you know, the prophecy of Christ coming as as seed, you know, as as the seed of Abraham. And, and the promises there, I mean, there are so many doctrines. I mean, even the reprobate doctrine there is found when God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities as well. Uh, I mean, every major Bible doctrine, you can trace it back somewhere, directly or indirectly, back to the book of Genesis. So it's a really important book, and I'm glad we're going through it right now as a church so you can see all these doc- doctrines come out, at the, out of that first book. The period also covers a, the period, obviously, from creation 
until the death of Joseph in Egypt. So you may remember how Joseph went into Egypt, his family joined him there in Egypt, and it completes, the book of Genesis finishes with the death of Joseph. That's the book of Genesis. Then we get to the book of Exodus. And the book of Exodus, well, think about the word Exodus. What do you think that sounds like? Kind of sounds like exit. Does it say exit up there on the door? I think Lily wrote exit, exit the other way. All right, that's where it comes from. The word exit and exodus have the same root meaning or the same root word. And exodus basically means a mass departure of people. So if, 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 someone's, if there's a group of people that, that are exiting a nation, maybe refugees, that would be seen as an exodus. And of course, who were the people that left? Who was that mass exodus? That was the children of the Israelites. They came out of Egypt, didn't they? And the period of Exodus is from is just before Moses' birth, or you can say from Moses' birth, all the way to Mount Sinai, when Moses delivers the Israelites out of Egypt and God gives him the commandments. It's also uh, the book of Exodus is also very famous for the Ten Commandments. You'll find the Ten Commandments there listed, and then God obviously gives Moses all the commandments there um, out at Mount Sinai, the law of Moses, the Old Testament proper as we would refer to it. The next book we have there in the book of um, the Old Testament is the book of Leviticus. And Leviticus is named after a tribe of of Israel. Which one is that? It's the the Levites, right? And if you guys remember, only the Levites were permitted to be the priests. And so a lot of the the book of Leviticus deals with the uh, tabernacle, deals with a lot of the the priestly uh, worship and the things they used to do, um, how they would serve in the Old Covenant. And... uh, God also instructs in the book of Leviticus how to set up a sacrificial system. Okay, he starts putting some order around the sacrifices. Now, there were sacrifices before, obviously, before this time, but it was kind of, um, how can I word it? Like, like seemingly arbitrary. You just find people every now and again offering sacrifices. But then in the book of Leviticus, God puts a proper order, a proper system in place when it comes to sacrificial uh, worship. And it also not just deals with that, but it also deals with dietary requirements that the Old Testament Israelites had, the social behavior, criminal activity, and the proper level of punishment for criminal offenses. Okay? So that's where we got a lot of the death penalty passages from, from the book of Leviticus. Going from the book of Leviticus, we go to the book of Numbers. The book of Numbers, why is it called Numbers? Why do you, why do you think, Isabel? Why is it called Numbers? That's what it's about, but it's called numbers because it's all about numbers. Yeah, it's all about numbers. It's called numbers because it's all about numbers. It's about population numbers. It's about financial requirements to build the tabernacle and all the other things that need to be built. It also has other numerical data in there. Okay, so never think that God is not interested in numbers. He's got an entire book in the Bible called Numbers, all right? So <laughs> it's just ridiculous when people say, oh, God doesn't care about the numbers. Of course he does, all right? But, uh, but it begins, and this might seem a little bit unusual because we have the book of Leviticus and the ex- book of Exodus is quite a large book as well. But it begins in the second year since the Israelites exited out of Egypt, okay? The second year. So it's pretty early on from the Exodus out of Egypt. Because, you know, Exodus, Leviticus, just, it's just a law. It's just God passing down law to Moses, to the children of Israel from Mount Sinai. And so it, it includes the remaining, the rest of the book of Numbers includes the remaining 38 years. Remember, they were 40 years in the wilderness. So if we pick it up from the second year, there's still another 38 years to go. Um, and I won't go into all the detail behind that. You guys know the story, how... Um, you know, they were too afraid to go to the promised land, so the punishment was that the generation would pass on, and those that were 20 and under would be those one, the ones that would uh, go into the promised land. But so we have the th- remaining 38 years uh, wandering in the wilderness, and it ends with the Israelites arriving at the Jordan River, prepared to cross the promised land. So that's the book of Numbers. That's what it leads us to. It leads us to the Israelites. Those 40 years in the wilderness have gone by, you know, the manna, all, all the stories there that you know about ready to cross the promised land. Then we get to the book of Deuteronomy. Okay, the book of Deuteronomy. Now, the book of Deuteronomy, it kind of sounds like duets. You know, and on Sunday we had, um, you know, Brother Alex and, and Annie sing a, they sang a du- duet. Okay, what's a duet? It means there were two people singing the song. And so when we look at the, the term Deuteronomy, it basically means the second law or the giving of the second law. It's a repetition 
of the same laws that were given to Moses before. But it's not just making another copy. You know, Moses instructed us to make another copy. It's not just making another copy for the sake of making another copy. Again, we've got the Israelites ready to go into the promised land. We have a brand new generation about to go and conquer that land. And so Moses repeats the same laws once again. You know, brings it back to their remembrance. You know, refreshes their memory. These are the laws that God gave us. This is a covenant that we entered into the law uh, with, with the Lord. And now this is the land that we need to take. So because it was a brand new generation, they needed to hear uh, the law once again. And of course, Deuteronomy also records Moses ordaining Joshua as the new leader. And it also records the death of Moses. So Moses, of course, did not go into the promised land. So those are the first five books known as the Pentateuch, written by Moses himself. And you say, how did Moses write about his death? It didn't end with his death. Well, you know... It's inspired by God, all right? I mean, God obviously knew Moses was going to pass away, and I'm assuming Moses wrote about it. Or, p- potentially, he wrote pretty much all of it, and then someone else just finished it off for him. I don't know. But at the end of the day, you know, these five books are, are known as the books of Moses. And then, so right now, we're dealing with a lot of history. So even though these first five books are known as the Pentateuch, it's still very historical. It's still very historical about how God passed, gave these promises that would come through you know, the Old Testament Israelites. But now we've got the situation, the Israelites are about to cross the Jordan River, about to cross to the, to the land of Canaan, and of course they're going to have to fight. There's going to be great wars with many of the Canaanites. And now Joshua, you know, he's already been a powerful warrior, a great leader. He's now the person that uh, Moses has put in place to uh, lead them into the Promised Land. So Joshua is the primary person in the book of Joshua. Makes sense, right, if it's called Joshua. And of course, the period of time from the book of Joshua is from Moses' death um, to the crossing into the promised land and conquering Canaan. It's a period of about 25 years, the book of Joshua. A period of about 25 years, though the conquest of the land was about seven years. So it's not just the conquest, it's not just the wars, but also what took place after that as well. And the book of Joshua, if you read it, it's a bit of a mixed book. It's a bit of, you get a bit of mixed feelings about the book as you read through it, because it does record their great victories. It does record the great victories of Israel, but it also demonstrates that they did not finish the job, the job that God had given them to do. Please take, go to Joshua now. Go to Joshua chapter 21. Joshua chapter 21. Joshua chapter 21, verse 43. They are, I really want you to turn there. Joshua 21, verse 43, because there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of false teaching out there. There are a lot of pastors, because of their Zionist agenda, because of their dispensationalism, that love saying that God never fulfilled the promise of the land to the Israelites. They love it because they want to talk about how now God is bringing the Israelites back to the land you know, of Canaan, back into, that, into the land of Palestine there today, and, and God's going to promise them that land now, that that promise is going to come into fruition. And they look at it because they see that the Israelites failed to conquer all the enemies on the land. And so they think that God failed somehow. But this is why these verses are so important. You can, you know, if people say that, it's not like they're always trying to be a deceiver. Sometimes they're just deceived. These are the things that get repeated over and over, generation after generation in Bible college. And I love these words here in Joshua 21 verse 43. It says, And the Lord gave unto Israel all the land. Hey, is there anything besides all? Once it's all the land, guess what? God's given them all the land, right? All the land which he swore to give unto their fathers, and they possessed it and dwelt therein. And the Lord gave them rest round about according to all that he swore unto their fathers. And there stood not a man of all their enemies before them, and the Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. There failed not aught of any good thing which the Lord hath spoken unto the house of Israel, all came to pass. How many times did we read all? All, all, all came to pass, right? All of it. Verse number, uh, what was it? Verse number 44. And the Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. You need to understand, you go, no, 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 it didn't happen because the enemies were still in the land. God did his promise. God delivered the enemies. It was the Israelites that failed to finish them off. It was the Israelites that failed, all right? It's not that God failed. God did exactly what He promised. Just because we mess up our lives doesn't mean we blame God. That happens. 
right? We get into a bad state, we get depressed, we get cast down, things don't seem to be going our way. Oh God, why, why aren't you helping me? He's probably helped you all the way along, but it's your failure that's let you down. The Israelites let themselves down, okay? And it, this, you know, I, I hate hearing preachers say that God failed them, or God did not fulfill it just yet, and He still will fulfill it. No, look, the Bible's crystal clear. God gave them the promises of the land exactly as He had promised them. It's the Israelites that failed, right? It's the Israelites that failed. And that's why it's a, it's a bit of a mixed book. Great successes, great victories. They're finally in the land. It's theirs for their possession. Not like uh, Abraham when he was sojourning in the land. No, now the land belonged to them, but they didn't take it as they, they should have. They didn't wipe out their enemies the way they were instructed to. So that's the bad news of the book of Joshua. That's why it has a bit of a mixed feel toward it. And the book of Joshua also records the death of Joshua. Now, you can go back to the table of contents if you like. Actually, no, no, go to Judges, the next book. Go to Judges 21. Go to Judges 21. So the next book we have is the book of Judges. So once, uh, you know, the Israelites are now on the land of Canaan, they've still got the enemies surrounding them. They've still got enemies around them. Yes, God gave them peace. But eventually, these enemies started to be a thorn in the flesh toward them. And, uh, you know, when we think of the term judges, you know, it's, you know we, when we think of a judge, we think of someone standing behind a, uh, what do they stand behind? They sit on these things, you know, in a court courtroom, and they, they listen to two sides, and, the, you know, the... What is the thing? They, it's not a pulpit. It's something else. Is it a bar? Is that what it's called? Okay, anyway. We think of judges like that, right? And yes, you know, part of the responsibility of the judges in the Old Testament was to pass judgment. But more than just that, the judges that God used in the Old Testament were military leaders. Okay, they were there to help deliver Israel out of the hand of enemies, of the enemies. And, so, and also setting the nation back in order. But look at Judges 21 verse 25. Judges 21 verse 25 gives us... You know, these words are, are repeated multiple times in the book of Judges. It says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And so even though we had this system of judges, it just seemed like people did not respect the authority. They were doing whatever they liked. They would turn their hearts against God. In fact, the book of Judges is a great book to learn about the cursings and the blessings of the Old Testament covenant. Because you may remember when God gave the covenant to the Israelites, He said, man, if you walk after my ways, you start, you know, you, you have me as your Lord God, I'll bless you, you'll be on this land. Hey, but if you turn against me, you don't, you know, you, you break my commandments, these kinds of things, you follow after God, other gods, you know, that God will destroy them. God will take them out of the land. And the book of Judges is a great book just illustrating that truth. You know, the, the period of time in the book of Judges is about a period of about 300 years. About 300 years. So we see generation after generation going through this cycle, going back to God, turning against God, going back to God, and God raising up judges every time the Israelites, you know, called out uh, for help from, from God. And so we see the, 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 the blessings and the cursings that fell upon the nation at this period of time. Uh, and the two, I guess the two most famous judges that you're going to read about are Gideon and Samson. Gideon and Samson. Now, the book of Judges, you can basically divide it into, into two ways. You've got Judges chapter 1 to chapter 16, um, which ends in the story of Samson. And these chapters, I believe they're mostly, or all of it, uh, is in chronological order. It, it's pretty easy to follow when you get to these, through these 16 chapters. But then chapters 17 to 21 are stories that can be scattered throughout that entire period of time. You know, somewhere within that 300-year period, that this, that this takes place, those stories are scattered throughout, and it's a bit hard to pinpoint exactly where that may, may be. It doesn't really matter. If, if God makes it like that, that's not the purpose behind it. The purpose is to take the spiritual lessons from those stories. So we have the book of Judges. Then we have Ruth. Now, please go to the next book in the Bible. Go to Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. So where does the book, book of Ruth take place? Why is it here? It seems odd to have a book named after a lady, right? Just right after Judges kind of thing. We have the book of Ruth. Look at, look at uh, Ruth 1.1. 1, 1. Ruth 1.1. 1, 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled, there we go, that there was a famine in the land and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. So when does the story of Ruth take place? It says when the judges ruled. Okay, so again, sometime during this 300 years, Right, this, the story of Ruth takes place. 
And Ruth is a, you see that they, they sojourn in the country of Moab, it said there. Uh, Ruth was a Moabitess. You know, she was not a Jew. She was a Gentile. And the story, you know, is, is named after Ruth. And what, what I love about her is as a Gentile woman, you know, she decided to make the God of Israel her God. Hey, she was not a physical descendant of Abraham. Okay. And we looked at this before when, we, when I went for the sermon called the true Jew. And we see how God can use this term in different ways. And so Ruth decided to make Israel her home. She decided to make the God of Israel her God. So she became an Israelite, as it were. She became a someone of the land, even though she was not a physical descendant. And what I love about her is she's a Gentile, but she was the great grandmother of King David. Later on, we get to King David, a very famous figure. She was the great grandmother of King David. And not only was she the great grandmother of King David, but she, because of that, she's in the lineage of Jesus Christ. So did God, God care that Jesus would be this pure blood Jew with no mixing of anything else? No, no way. He even calls an entire book after a Gentile woman. Okay, praise God for that. But a lot of Christians don't know that. Like, a lot, honestly, a lot of Christians don't realize this. You know, they, they think that, you know, Ruth's a Jew or something like that. No, she was a Gentile, but she made the right decision to follow the right God, to turn away from false gods. So it's a story of a Gentile woman becomes a Jew, making the God of Israel her God, and God take, took care of her needs, and eventually she married a godly man in Boaz. It's a really great story, uh, the book of Ruth. So even men, it's, called, it's uh, named after a lady. It's still a really great book. Uh, I would really recommend it. If it's one of those books you don't tend to read much, I really recommend you read it. I think it's one of the better books in the Bible, in my opinion. It's, 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 very, uh, it's, a, it's a very powerful story in my view. Anyway, we get to, after Ruth, we get to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. And uh, again, we, we, we talk about a period where, where the judges were ruling Israel before the kings uh, were around. And so 1 Samuel takes place from before, before the birth of Samuel till the death of King Saul, which was the first king of Israel. The book of the first Samuel is a period of about 110 years, roughly. And um, if you guys can go to 1 Samuel chapter 8, go to 1 Samuel chapter 8. And uh, we tend to call Samuel a prophet, don't we? Usually we tend to call him a prophet. And he is a prophet, don't get me wrong. He is a prophet. But because this was a period of time before the kings... Samuel was also the last righteous judge. When you look at the, the, you know, the, the time of the judges, Samuel was that last judge for Israel before the kings came into play. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 1. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 1. And it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. So you can see there, he's a judge, and now he wants to appoint his sons as judges of Israel. But he, he was actually a really bad father. He, he, he didn't do a really good job raising his kids. Verse number two. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel, and the second Abiah. Sorry, the name of the second Abiah. They were judges in Beersheba. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after Luca, and took bribes and perverted judgment. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old. And thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. So there you go. There's a story. So the Israelites, they wanted a king. It was never God's intention for them to have a king besides King Jesus, of course. Uh, but this was a, a petition. And I guess Samuel had, had messed up to some extent here. You know, raised children that were not godly, that were after money, that were very wicked people. And they didn't, I, I mean, I wouldn't want the sons of Samuel to rule over me. Okay, so I kind of understand where they're coming from, even though that wasn't God's intention. And so uh, this book, obviously, we have the appointment of King Saul as the first king of Israel. And like I said, it ends with his death. But uh, the book of 1 Samuel is also famous for the stories of young King David, young, da young David before he was a king. So, you know, stories like him killing Goliath and many other, and, and many other stories that, you know, he was uh, successful, other, other victories that he had. Uh, that's 1 Samuel. Then we have 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel continues the story of David from 1 Samuel, uh, but now as the king of Israel. And he ruled as a king for about 40 years. And the first 10 chapters of 1 Samuel, uh, again, this book, you can kind of divide it into two, in a way. It kind of, kind of like that mixed feeling that you get with the book of uh, Joshua. Uh, the first 10 chapters of David's life 
has these great successes, great victories. You know, you see how godly, how God was using David and how David was a man after God's own heart. You see that in those first 10 chapters. But then from chapter 11, it takes a turn. Chapter 11 is where he commits adultery with Bathsheba. And then, you know, the, the following chapters basically have the disastrous stories of his children. You know, his children um, made some terrible mistakes, terrible mistakes. And of course, Absalom, probably the, the chief one amongst uh, his children, who briefly overthrew David's kingdom for a period of time, and then uh, he, he died to death as well. So uh, it's, it's kind of interesting. We have Samuel, we have David, godly men, and they just didn't do great jobs with their kids, you know. And so we need to be careful. You know, we take these lessons, of course, as parents. You know, we could be godly. We could be seeking the, uh, the Lord. But we need to make sure we raise up our kids to love the Lord and not to, not to neglect them. Um, you know, I kind of think maybe these men were too busy. I don't know, you know, to neglect their children like that. But anyway, that's Second Samuel. Um, then we have First Kings. First Kings. So f- we have um, basically First Kings, Second Kings, First Chronicles, Second Chronicles. It uh, gives us a very uh, a, a historical record of the kings that ruled over Egypt. And then after it was split into the two kingdoms, the kings of Judah and the kings of Israel as well, of the northern, ki- uh, tribe of, of northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, but First Kings begins near, near the death of David. So David's about to pass away with First Kings. And he anoints Solomon as his successor. Solomon to be the next king, King Solomon. And uh, this book, First Kings, is well known for recording the building of the first temple. So you may remember David wanted to build the first temple. God said no, but Solomon was the one that would eventually be the one to build that first temple. Um, it records Israel in its greatest state. You'll never find the nation of Israel at a greater position than this. Um, well, I guess until Jesus Christ comes back with his you know, spiritual Israel in the millennium. But uh, here we have Israel in its greatest state, greatest blessings, greatest power, you know, a lot of wealth. You know, the people, the surrounding nations were you know, kind of, not made of envious, but, you know, they, they could see the hand of God, you know, working in Israel. And um, it, it uh, yeah, sorry. And so it's, we, most of it's about Solomon. The beginning of it's about King Solomon. And then it, it, it leads up to his death. And after his death, the kingdom of Israel is divided into two kingdoms, the southern kingdom of Judah, which were prim- primarily um, uh, Judah, that's it, yeah, primarily the tribe of Judah and the uh, tribe of Benjamin. But they also had many of the Levites there because uh, Jerusalem and the temple were positioned on that part of the, on the southern kingdom. So there were a lot of Levites there at that time. And then the northern kingdom retained the name of Israel, but it was the other 10 tribes of Israel that made up that kingdom, most of that kingdom. And uh, so that's kind of the division of the two occurs here in 1 Kings. And then it begins to follow the two sets of kings. Uh, the kings of Israel, the northern tribe of, of Israel, were mostly evil. The only exception to that was Jehu. He wasn't the greatest, but he was, he was pretty decent compared to the other kings there of, of the northern tribe of, or northern kingdom of Israel. And then we have the kings of Judah who did much better. They weren't perfect. Some of them were, were pretty uh, wicked guys, but most of those kings were good or pretty decent. Pretty decent in the eyes of God. Um, they, they fared much better than, their, uh, than the northern kingdom but it also has their failings as well. And uh, First Kings is also known for many of the great exploits that Elijah the prophet did. Elijah is one of the most famous prophets we read about in the Bible. He did a lot of great exploits there in First Kings. Then we go to Second Kings. Second Kings, which is essentially just a continuation of First Kings. Um, again, all the kings of Israel, um, or the northern kingdom here, they're all evil in Second Kings. You can't find anyone good uh, from, the, from the kings of Israel. Uh, but the main event from this book is the Assyrian Empire. The, Ass- the Assyrian Empire, very powerful. They invade the northern kingdom of Israel. They scatter the people. They take them into captivity. And it basically, that's kind of the end of those ten tribes that you'll ever see. They start to get mixed. They get scattered throughout the earth. Some of them remain on the land. But uh, they eventually became known as the Samaritans, of these group of people, because Samaria became the capital city um, of that place. And uh, it also records, Second Kings also records Elijah being taken up to, to heaven without dying. Then we have First Chronicles. First Chronicles. So First Chronicles, basically, Chronicles now just repeats the same historical records that we've seen before. And you say, why is that? Well, it's, it's excellent. Right? It's excellent because it, it, it demonstrates to us the accuracy of the Bible. 
You know, we have four Gospels. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that tell us about Jesus Christ. And if we only had the one Gospel and people are like, oh, I don't think that Jesus existed, you know, well, we got four witnesses. We got four writers, people that investigated, people that knew him, you know, writing these books. And so when we have these stories that overlap, you know, it adds further depth to the, to the historical records. It adds further, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, um, validity? To, 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 the, to the historical records that we have in the Bible. And it doesn't, I mean, I don't, need, I don't really need to wonder as well, are these accurate or not? I've already concluded that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. I've already concluded it's perfect, all right? So I can just trust it for what it is. But First Chronicle records the events of Second Samuel. So it has a lot of King David again. We go back to knowing about King David and also records the events of First Kings in First Chronicles. And uh, yeah, by comparing the kings and the chronicles, it can build a, a fuller picture of the reign of the kings. And, but essentially, it's a retelling of the same events, the same stories that we're familiar with. Then Second Chronicles, again, retells much about King Solomon um, and, and what he did, what, what he was able to accomplish by creating this powerful kingdom. And it, the period of time from Second Chronicles is from King Solomon till the Babylonian captivity. So just, just try to keep this in mind, kids. The northern kingdom of Israel, they were uh, driven away or even taken captivity by the Assyrian Empire. But the southern kingdom of Judah were bring, brought into captivity by the Babylonian Empire, by the Babylonians. Okay? And so Second Chronicles ends with that Babylonian captivity. Then we have the book of Ezra. Okay? And uh, Ezra and then Nehemiah and Esther, these books are still historical books. They continue the chronology after the Bab Babylonian captivity. So in the book of Ezra, uh, Ezra is, is named after Ezra, who was a scribe, and he wrote of the events of the Jews returning back to Jerusalem from Babylonian captivity. How many, which of the kids remembers how long the Babylonian captivity was? How many years? Anyone remember? Huh? Babylonian captivity. 70, 70 years, 70 years, right, was the Babylonian captivity, and then God had told them they would return back to the land. So this is Ezra the scribe writing the events of the Jews going back to Jerusalem. And uh, the book of Ezra is divided into two parts, okay, two parts. Maybe you noticed this as you read it. Um, I remember when I first read Ezra, I was kind of scratching my head because I couldn't get what's going on. But there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a period of time split between these two parts. But chapters 1 to 6, chapters 1 to 6 of the book of Ezra, covers Zerubbabel, who leads the first wave of the Jews um, from Babylon, returning back to um, Jerusalem. And Zerubbabel was, uh, is known for building the foundations of the second temple, the foundations of the second temple. I forgot to mention, when, when the, uh, the Jews were taken into Babylonian captivity, they destroyed the city, they, they destroyed the temple. And so they're going back to Jerusalem, they're going back to a destroyed city, they're having to rebuild it, they're having to rebuild the temple, a brand new temple, the second temple. But this is why sometimes you might hear preachers refer to the second temple as Zerubbabel's temple. I don't know if you've ever heard that before. A lot of people like to use that term, Zerubbabel's temple, and it's just because he was the one that laid the foundation of this second temple. But then chapters 7 to 10 in the book of Ezra takes place more than 60 years later, Okay more than 60 years later, where Ezra now leads a second wave of Jews returning back to Jerusalem, okay? And the book of Ezra ends with the Jews but basically back to practicing uh, temple worship and doing the sacrifices. After the book of Ezra, we have the book of Nehemiah, okay? The book of Nehemiah. And in some ways, the book of Nehemiah is very similar to the book of Ezra. It's, it's roughly the same time period. You'll read a lot about Ezra as, as well in the book of Nehemiah, about the man Ezra and the time and the purpose. But Nehemiah... Uh, leads a third wave, a third wave of Jews from captivity to Jerusalem. So this is a little, a few years later. They're doing the same job. They're, they're coming back to Jerusalem. And uh, Nehemiah proved to be an amazing leader. And his great success was rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. You know, at a very quick pace, rebuilt the walls. And against the odds, against a lot of odds, he was able to rebuild those walls, Okay. So that's, that's the, the events. The Jews returning back to um, uh, Israel or, or to Jerusalem um, from their Babylonian captivity. Now we've got one book left. That's the book of Esther. Another book named by uh, a lady. Okay? Now um, the book of Esther 
is the story of Mordecai and Esther. And they're, um, they're in, a lot of the Jews are in, are in a Persian city here. I can't remember what, I, I didn't write down what it's called. But they're in Persia. And the reason they're in Persia is because uh, it's a, it was a result of the Babylonian captivity. You know, the Babylonian Empire, you know, reached a lot of areas. Uh, but now the Persian Empire had grown in, in power. They had taken over a lot of, the, pla- a lot of the, the, the cities and the places that Babylon once ruled from. And so now we find Mordecai and Esther, um, two, they're actually cousins. But Mordecai was much older than Esther, and so he kind of adopted her and raised her as, her own, as his own daughter in a way. And so many times we kind of, when he preaches, they might refer to Mordecai as her uncle. You know, but even though they were first cousins, but he was much older. So in that sense, you know, some people think of him as, a, as an uncle to Esther. And uh, they remained in Persia um, following the Babylonian captivity. They were not part of the, the groups that were returning back to Jerusalem. And if you know the story, Esther was given into marriage. She became a queen. She was given into marriage to King Xerxes um, and crowned queen. Now, there was Haman, Haman, who was second in command um, in that empire, uh, just under the king. And Haman hated the Jews, okay, and wanted to destroy them. And that's really bad timing for Haman because God's working in bringing the Jews back, right? Bringing the Jews back to Jerusalem. And we have Haman wanting to destroy them. And so, um, you know, because of, and the story is basically because of Esther's courage. Because of her courage and her faith, she was able to turn the tide, and Haman was killed instead of the Jews. And many of the Persians, the Bible said, became Jews. Many of them received the God of Israel as their God. They believed in the God of Israel. And so that's the end of Esther. So the, the, you know, the, the timing of the book of Esther, the reason why it's here is because it takes place around the same time of Ezra and Nehemiah. I'm not sure exactly when, um, but around the same time as the Jews are making their way back to Jerusalem. So that's, that's the timing that we have here. All right. That's pretty much, these are the historical books. Okay. And then things are pretty quiet for about 400 years after all this until Jesus Christ appears on the scene. But you're saying to me, but we've got so many more Old Testament books to go through. Yeah, we do. We'll go through them next week. Okay. But um, I, I love how the Lord set out these books for us in the Bible at the beginning because it's, it's just a lot of history. It's a lot of history. Now, the rest of the Old Testament books, they're just as important, they're just as good, but they fill in a lot of the gaps during this historical uh, period. We, we learn about the, the pers- personal stories. You know, we, we learn a lot about Solomon, you know, the book of Proverbs um, and uh, the book of, you know, Song of Solomon. We, we see some of his writings, we see more of his personal life, not just the story of him being a king, but more about his personal life. Uh, we see, you know, the writings of the prophets. And if you, if you know the history you'll then be able to place the prophets at the right time in history and you have a better picture of what they taught and why they preached certain messages that came from God. I'll tell you why this is important. Because there's a lot of pastors out there, once again, with their Zionist uh, ideologies, that look at many of the Old Testament prophets and, and, and they pull out passages that's, that talk about how God's going to bring the Jews back to the land. And they say, see, you know, he's done it since 1948, right? Since the Second World War, God's bringing the Jews back to the land. But if you just could take that prophet and place him in the timeline, you'll know what he's talking about. He's talking about the Babylonian captivity, about the Jews leaving the Babylonian captivity and returning back to Jerusalem. That's what a lot of the the prophets are preaching about. Or prior to that, and how they're going to be taken into captivity, how God's going to curse them and, and do all these kinds of things as they're taken there. So it's really important for you to understand the history first and foremost, you know, I could have gone on and on. I mean, so many stories, you know, so many famous stories, so many famous men that I didn't even talk about. But I hope this gives you a, a, a good sense. We're, we're trying to rightly divide the word of truth. Next week, we'll go through the rest of the Old Testament books. And I'm hoping the week after that, we can just go through the New Testament books. But I hope that's given you some insight that's hopefully increased a bit of your learning, maybe plug some holes that you, didn't, that you might have had before. Let's pray.